أعوذ بالله من شر الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء The first of your loudest salawat in honor of our Prophet and the greatest man to walk this earth Al-Habib Al-Mustafa Muhammad The second of your loudest salawat in honor of the greatest lady to walk this earth, Al Hawra Al Batul Fatima. And the third and your final salawat in honor of our Imam, Imam Sahib Al Asri Wa Zaman. Inshallah, in light of a particular brother that messaged me that a particular topic he'd like to look in depth and an important one uh, as that which is the topic of justice now the question was that can you define or can we comprehend the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can we look at it from his guardians on earth from his hujaj on earth and the reply inshallah will be for tonight to look at if we or can we or can we not understand or comprehend in one way or another the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there a way to grasp it or is it beyond us and then inshallah by looking into that faculty with a few examples we can look at the justice of the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the justice of Allah's vicegerents on earth the a'imma sallallahu alayhi, alayhum afdal salatu wa salam and the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and in that aspect, we can have a deeper understanding and a more holistic vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's justice. Now, in order to start for tonight's lecture, please help me in reciting one final salawat for the blessings of everyone here and, all, and to go to all the people that have been deceased and of our loved ones. Please recite a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we know, one of the five pillars of our particular school of thought is the justice of Allah. Where we find the main difference is that we believe in five and other schools of thought only believe in three. The five that we believe in is to the idea of Tawheed. The other school also has the idea of Tawheed. We believe in idea of Nubuwa. The other school also has the idea of Nubuwa. We believe in Mi'ad, the day of resurrection, judgment day. They also believe... However, they stay there. We have an extra two that differentiates us. One of which being Imameh, which is solely and wholeheartedly within the school of Ahlul Bayt. And the final one is Adaleh. And that's the one we can be proud of. When we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does everything with justice. Everything Allah does is just. However, other schools of thought have the idea that what? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, and he can be oppressive. He cannot be just, he doesn't have to be in a particular containment. Therefore, we can't say that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says that I am all just, we take that from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we try to understand it even though it's beyond us. And I'll give you an example of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's justice is beyond us. However, we have to believe in it. Musa alayhi afdal salatu wa salam, he goes and asks Allah the same question. He says, Allah, I know that you are all just. However, I want to understand it. I want to see your justice. Allah says, you want to see my justice? He says, yes. Show me your justice. He says, not a problem. He says, there's going to be a well. I want you to keep an eye on that well. So that well, Musa looks at that well and he sees a night come or a forest come towards that well. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah. You find when that forest comes, He's all hooded up, he has his armor, his horse, he comes down to take a bit of water. 
as he wants to take water, a money sack falls down into the well or alongside the well. He rides off. Now a young man comes and he finds that near the well. There's money near the well. He's thinking, you know what? Beautiful. He's taking that money and he's gone. An old man comes and he comes to the well. At the same time, the night comes back. Now the man, the old man, he's looking at the night and says, can I help you? He says, you've taken my money. I'm sure I dropped it here. I need that money back. And they have an argument. They have collision between them in which the knight or the Faris at the time takes his sword and beheads the old man. Then Jibrail comes down and he says, he says, Musa, did you see Allah's justice? Musa's thinking, where's the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I've seen a man behead an old man. I've seen someone that lost his money. Another man that's, that took money and ran away with it. Where's Allah's justice? He says, this is the essence of Allah's justice. You cannot see it. He says, please explain. I want to grasp this. I want to grasp the idea of Allah's justice. Then he says, it's easy. You see that night. And that young boy, he says, yes. He says, that night owed that boy's father this amount, and the exact amount was in that pouch. He's run away with it. He says, that old man killed that night's father with no reason. He says, this is the justice that he takes back. Now look at Allah's justice. We can't comprehend that Musa is a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at first glance. Without the explanation, he could not understand Allah's justice. We cannot comprehend the depth of Allah's justice. In the Quran, when we look at Surah Al-Kahf, when we find that Musa wants to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, says, I want to learn more, I want to increase in knowledge. And then he sends him, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to, as one of his servants. And he takes him to Al-Khudr. When he's in a journey with Khudr, what does he say? Khudr says, do not ask me or do not question me about what I do. Remember, Musa had the knowledge of Sharia. Khudr had a different knowledge. He saw people's end results, their destiny, what Allah has written for them. He says to Musa, do not question anything I do until I tell you. So on the way, the first thing, what does the Quran say? There was a ship and he defected that ship so it may sink. Musa speaks out. He says, how could you defect this? These people might sink. He says, didn't I tell you not to question what I act unless I told you? He says, let me be patient. Give me another chance. On the second account, he finds a boy. He kills the boy. Musa speaks out. Musa says, how could you kill a nafs without any reason behind it? He says, I told you not to question me. He says, let me be patient. Give me another chance. On the third occasion, he finds a wall that's about to collapse and he rebuilds it. Musa says, why have you rebuilt it? You could have actually got an ajr for this. Why did you just do it by yourself? He says, I told you not to question me. This is where our journey departs, our paths depart. Why? He says, I'll give you an explanation as to what I do, what I do. He says, Allah has given me the knowledge that the emperor of the time will take the boats. Therefore, I made this boat defected so they don't take it from these two particular poor people. On the second level, he says what? He says that boy was causing calamities to his parents. He was deviated. His parents were mu'mineen. His parents were very righteous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to take his life and wanted to give them a replacement that is not deviant, that is righteous, that is pure. He says on the third level, this particular wall that was collapsing had a treasure under it. And the treasure belonged to these two boys that were very poor but righteous. I built it so when they reach an older age, they will open that particular wall and find that which is already theirs. So he tells Musa, he says, this is the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the vision. This is what Allah has installed. He says, you do not see it. Now, can we imagine nowadays that we want to comprehend why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we question ourselves. These are questions that arise. Why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given this particular person this amount of money? This other person this amount of money. This one's in poverty. This one is in luxurious homes. Because we have that thought process. Why is it Allah has given this person and is not given that person? The justice, we need days to talk about these ideas and these examples. But we know that at the end of the day, Allah is just. That's what we have belief in. 
Allah is just in all that he does. There's a reason behind it. In chapter 2, verse 185, he says, Allah does not burden a soul more than it can handle. They may be able to handle a particular aspect. I may not be. I may not be able to, I may be able to handle a particular concept. They may not, not able to be. So that's the concept. Allah balances it. He knows each and every individual and their needs. Each and every individual and what they're capable of. Allah's justice. Only profound to those that are of high stature. Only profound to those such as Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <laughs> let's look at examples from our Imams. And let's not go past the one person that George Ordah comes and writes. This is the voice of human justice. Let's take the examples of the life of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Let's look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's representative on earth after the Prophet of Islam is and how just he is. And take from these examples to understand the difference between a normal ruler and a normal khalif or the khalifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth. That's the difference we have to look at. So on one analogy, or one of the stories of Ali ibn Abi Talib, and this is a very, very interesting one because we have to look at this particular story and put it into the context of our lives. When Ali ibn Abi Talib takes the Khilafah, when everyone came, comes to the house of Ali ibn Abi Talib, as you know, the first Khalif, six people chose him. They said this will be the ruler for the entire Muslim nation. The second Khalifa was a letter, basically, or a will from the first Khalifa to say, you know what, this is the second Khalifa. The third Khalifa was chosen also by a group of people in a closed house scenario. The only Khalifa that was chosen actually by the people that came towards their house that they all gathered in front of the house of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the only person. Look at the history books. Ali ibn Abi Talib, when the people gathered in front of his house, look at the words of Ali ibn Abi Talib. They said, where is Ali? So they went searching for Ali ibn Abi Talib. And they found him fixing his sandals. Everyone knows this story, but I want to look into a specific wording of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now it's found, it's found him, what? Fixing his sandals. When he fixes his sandals, the person comes to him, one of his companions, says, Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, Ya Amir al muminin there are people outside your house wanting to give you bay'ah, your allegiance. They want you as their leader. So he says, they can wait. He says, everyone's waiting for you. He says, what is the amount? Or what's the value of these sandals that I'm fixing? He says, it's nothing, it's worth nothing. The sandals, imagine. I even thought, I said, what's the value of these sandals that I'm fixing? He says, it's, 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 it doesn't really have a value. It's, it's worthless, kind of. He says, these sandals that I'm fixing, look at the wording of Ali ibn Talib. He says, these sandals that I'm fixing are worth more to me than this khilafah that everyone seeks. Unless I can instill justice and gets rid of any injustice. That's the wording of Ali ibn Abi Talib. That's the person when he is compared, inshallah we'll, we'll give him the comparison between Ali ibn Abi Talib and the prophets later on tonight. When he is compared, we'll look at the difference between Ali ibn Abi Talib and the others. When Ali ibn Abi Talib, he gains the Khilafah, two of the people, or two of the people that said that they were the companions of Ali ibn Talib come to his house. Talha and Zubair come to Ali ibn Abi Talib's house and they ask him for the Khilafah. And they said, we want you to make us governors of this particular place and this particular place. Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib replies by saying, anyone that's asked me for a position, I will not give. If you ask me for a position, I won't give you a position. But before he answers them, look at the justice of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He was writing for Bayt al-Mal. He was writing and writing and writing for Bayt al-Mal. It was dark. He had a candle. As soon as they came in, Ali ibn Talib asked them. They said, is it personal or is it for an issue regarding what? Khilafah, regarding Bayt al-Mal, regarding any issues with Islam. They said, no, it's a personal is issue. What did Ali ibn Talib do? He had a candle. He extinguishes the candle. Removes that candle. Brings another candle out. Opens that candle. And they're looking at Ali ibn Abi Talib and they said, what, what are you doing? He says, that candle, look at the justice. This is what I want us to look into our lives. Do we do this in our lives? He says, that candle, what's the, what's the value of a candle? It's, 
nowadays, a candle you can purchase for under a dollar, isn't it? A dollar is worthless. But look at the justice. Look at the idea. Look at the thought process behind such a thing. He says that candle was purchased using the wealth of what? Of the money of the Muslims. I only use it when dealing with issues regarding the Muslims of the time. He says this candle that I brought out is purchased with Ali ibn Abi Talib's money. And this will be used with my personal use. So small. Story is so small. However, look at the significance behind it. Look at the significant thought process behind it. Wa alaykum as wa rahmatullah. Look at the thought process. That's Ali ibn Abi Talib. When Ali was Khalifa at the time and a Christian man took his shield, everyone looks and may overlook this particular story, but if you analyze the depth of Ali ibn Abi Talib's justice, you'll begin to see why he's the Khalifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth. A Christian man. Ali ibn Abi Talib is the Khalifa of the time. You can imagine nowadays, can you imagine you taking any ruler on earth from the start of history till the end of history? Can you imagine taking any ruler of the time and taking him to a courtroom? Anyone. The second Khalifa once heard someone say something in a wrong manner about him. He had him whipped. He had him whipped. This Christian man takes the shield of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali says, that's my shield. And it was Ali ibn Abi Talib's shield. He says, that's my shield. He says, no, it's not. Prove it. He says, I want to take you to court. He says, your court? He says, yes. So they go towards the courtroom. Look at the, look at the depth of Ali ibn Abi Talib's justice. He goes to the courtroom in front of the judge. Imagine the judge thinking the Khalifa of the time is here to be judged. What's the issue? He says, well, such and such person has, uh, the Christian man has my shield. He looks at the Christian man and he says, is that your shield? He says, yes, that's my shield. So he sits him down, he says, okay. He names the Christian man by his name. And then he refers to Ali ibn Abi Talib by Abu al-Hassan. He gave him a status. As you know, the kunya is a status. Ali ibn Abi Talib objects. He, say, you, he says, you are my judge in my courtroom. He says, how could you become unjust by calling this Christian man by his name and me and you honor me by my kunya? Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, if you call him by his name, call me by my name. Don't elevate me from the start. He says, be just in your actions. He's in the courtroom, but he's teaching the judge. So he says, Ali ibn Abi Talib, do you have anyone to bear witness? He says, I don't have any bear witnesses besides myself. I know that this is my shield. The other person says, because you're in possession of the shield, I will have to grant you the shield. Because he does not, Ali ibn Abi Talib didn't have anyone to bear witness for him. So the court case goes to the Christian man. Now look at this. After Ali ibn Abi Talib gave the shield in the courtroom to the Christian man, the Christian man comes outside to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Look at what the Christian man has said. The Christian man looks up to Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, I have bear witnessed Allah's justice on earth. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, what do you mean? He says, where on earth can you even comprehend that a man outside the religion of Islam comes into Islamic territory, lives amongst the people, takes the position, he admits it, he says, he takes the position of the Khalifa of the time, takes him to his own courtroom and wins the case. He says, that Lord that you worship, that Lord that you worship, I want to worship him also. And then and there, he says, I bear witness that there is no God but your God. And I believe that the Prophet Muhammad is his messenger. And you are the Khalifa after him. That's the justice. That's the justice, brothers and sisters. Ali ibn Abi Talib had a vision like no other. When Ali ibn Abi Talib would decipher particular aspects, I'll give you a, a mathematical equation of justice. When Ali ibn Abi Talib was in the courtroom, and I need your focus with this, you might even need to use your hands to count what I'm about to tell you. There was a stranger that came past, two people eating bread. One person had five loaves of bread. The other one had three loaves of bread. In total, there's eight loaves of bread. Let's look at this. 
A man, they force him to come and eat with them. He says, not a problem, I'll eat with you. Every single slice of bread they made into thirds. Each slice of bread was made into third. And everyone ate equally. Everyone had eight thirds. We're done with that. The man on leaving these two people, they, he gave them eight dirhams. As soon as he finished, they start to, to have a dispute between them. One of them says, I provided five loaves of bread. You provided three loaves of bread. Take three dirhams and I'll take five. The other man says no. He became, what do we say? He wanted more than he deserved. But he says, I want half. He says, you provided loaves of bread. I provided loaves of bread. Let's go four by four. They disputed on that one dirham. He says, let's take this idea to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Let him decipher between us. So they go to Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, what's the issue? He says, such and such has happened. He says, he wants four. I've already given him three because I had five loaves. He had three loaves. I've taken five dirhams. He want, he'll, I'll give him three. He says, he says to the man that wanted four, not three. He says, he's being more than generous towards you. Take it. The man says, no, I want you to make a judgment. I want four out of the eight. I want the half. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, you only deserve one out of that eight. Take one, and the other one deserves seven. He says, what do you mean, Ali ibn Abi Talib? He's offering me three. I wanted four. You, you gave me only one. I says, that's the justice of it. He says, please explain to me. Let's, le let's look at the explanation of Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is the mathematical genius of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now imagine, we have eight loaves of bread. Each loaf was made into thirds. Now imagine your fingers. Each one of these portions is a portion that was eaten. Each person ate equally. So each one had eight pieces. So imagine the person that had three, he ate seven of those pieces. Uh, sorry, he ate eight of those pieces and remaining was one. One piece remaining from his side. The other person, he ate all his and what was remaining? Seven was remaining. Therefore, Ali ibn Abi Talib says what? He says, you fed him with seven pieces Therefore, you have seven dirhams. You have fed him with one piece. Therefore, you only deserve one dirham. Sallu ala Muhammad. Could any one of us think of it? I, I looked at the hadith. I'm reading it. I'm saying, yeah, you know, three, four. He deserves four. Should he get four? There's a difference between our knowledge and Ali ibn Abi Talib's. There's a difference between what Ali ibn Talib would rule and our imams would rule, deciphering the Qur'an to its utmost depth and our judgments, brothers and sisters. That's why we need the hujjahs on earth to give us the right from the wrong. That's why we all, every single Muslim on earth is deciphered between this particular type of wudu and another type of wudu. That's why we need the hujjah on earth to give us the right path, to give us the right ruling, the right judgment, the right justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I end with a story to give you an idea of the status of Ali ibn Abi Talib and I end on this inshallah and I give the pulpit inshallah to the Shaykh to enlighten us. A, a woman comes into the courtroom of one of the Abbasid Khalifas of the time. As it's narrated as, as Al-Hajjaj was the Khalifa of the time, this woman comes in and her head was on the floor, she's walking. And he says, lift your head up. Look up, do not look down. She says, look at the reply of this lady to give you an idea of who this lady was. She says, Allah does not allow me to look at something that, he, that displeases him. Meaning the Khalifa of the time. He replies by saying, tell me who's better. After a long debate, he says, tell me who's better. Ali ibn Abi Talib or Muawiyah? So the woman says, what kind of comparison is this? He says, just tell me who's better, Ali ibn Abi Talib or Muawiyah. He says, you're, you're comparing a man of greatness with Muawiyah. He says, what, do you, what would you prefer me to compare him with? He says, compare Ali ibn Abi Talib, not with normal people. Compare him with the NBA. He says, Ali ibn Abi Talib is greater than the NBA. He says, how so? And she begins. She begins this narration. She says, Ali ibn Abi Talib is greater than Ibrahim. He says, how? He says, Ibrahim in the Quran, what does he say? He says, show me how you resurrect the dead, O Allah. 
so I may increase in my yaqeen. Ali ibn Talib, what does he say? He says, if the veils were unveiled, were unveiled, if these veils were taken away, and I begin to see everything in its essence, I would not increase, nor will I decrease in yaqeen. Number one. Number two, he says, look at, she says, look at the Prophet. And as Prophet Sulaiman, when he prays to Allah, give me a kingdom like none other before me and none other after me. He says, but look at Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, to the dunya, talaktuki thalath. He says, look at that. He says, look at Musa. He was scared to go back to his qawm because he killed one person. He says, look at Ali. When Surah At-Tawbah came and the Prophet gave him the Surah to take back to Quraysh, knowing very well that he, there was not a household in Quraysh except that he killed a member of. He says he did not hesitate to go towards that particular message. Then she came to Isa and Hajjaj at the time is saying, no way Ali would be greater than Isa. What's the comparison rating that she would give about Ali ibn Abi Talib and Isa? Isa is the one that spoke at birth. Isa is Ruh Allah. Isa is the one that was born without a father. How can she compare Isa with Ali ibn Abi Talib? She says, look at Isa um, when his mother was giving birth to him. Allah said, go out of the Holy Land. This is for praying. Go out and give birth to Isa. He says, but look at Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only increased him in blessings. He said he, he opened up his house for his mother to give birth to Ali ibn Abi Talib inside. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. That's the comparison that she gave Ali ibn Abi Talib to show you the greatness of Ali ibn Abi Talib. I end on this, brothers and sisters, and I just wanted to highlight and to answer the brother's question in the idea of justice, Allah's justice, and we cannot comprehend it. We can analyze it, we can give analogies, examples, but we can't comprehend its depth. Only the ma'asumin can. Only hujajullah. Only the mercy of Allah, Allah's mirror images on earth. And inshallah, we keep learning about the Ahl al-Bayt, keep increasing our knowledge towards Ahl al-Bayt. So in order to have the blessing of their ma'rafah, the blessing of their shafa'a, to go in the footsteps of Ahl al-Bayt, and inshallah, learn and follow in their footsteps. And inshallah, we end for tonight by reciting the blessed Surah Al-Mubarakat Al-Fatiha. تسبقها الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد